This is The Lion of Mars by Jennifer Holm. I hope you enjoy. Start off with an email via secure communication. Date, March 5, 2091. From Commander Dexter to U.S. Territorial Command. Message, Situation Report. The surface digicam at the northwest quadrant of the settlement has been destroyed. The pole supporting it was knocked over as well. It is my conclusion that this was done deliberately by a hostile actor. Please advise. Cy Dexter, Commander, Expeditionary and Settlement Team, U.S. Territory, Mars. Chapter 1, Nest. The trip to Mars was the hardest thing they'd ever experienced. <clears throat> That's what the grown-ups said. The small, cramped ship, the constant fear of something going wrong, the knowledge that they could never return to Earth. But honestly, it sounded like a cakewalk compared to sharing a bedroom with Alby. Because he snored. I hadn't had a decent night's sleep since Alby started bunking with me. I tried just about everything to block out the noise. Earplugs, sleeping under the blanket, even a thick hat with ear flaps. But none of them worked. It was surprising because Alby was perfect. He was easygoing and did his chores without complaining, and of all us kids, he was the least likely to throw a fuss. The grown-ups trusted him, even Cy. But it turned out there was one thing that Albie wasn't good at, sleeping quietly. And I didn't know which was worse, Albie snoring or Trey wanting to change rooms. Now for as long as I could remember, Trey had slept in the bed across from mine. My drawings of cats and his drawings of aliens had papered the walls. Our plastic models crowded the shelves together. And then two months ago, Trey suddenly asked to switch bedrooms. And the next thing I knew, Trey was sleeping across the hall in the older kids' room with Vera and Flossie while Albie was snoring in mine. And me? I wasn't sleeping at all. And neither was Leo from the looks of it. The old cat was sitting up in bed, flicking his tail in annoyance. This room switching thing had happened once before. Back when Trey and I were little, the grown-ups had moved us boys into one room and the girls into the other. Albie was older than me and Trey, and so he was allowed to stay up later. But the problem was that Albie would make a lot of noise when he came to bed and he'd wake us up. The experiment was abandoned after a week. And now, all these years later, Albie was keeping me awake again. Across the room from me, Albie let out a loud, waffling snort. I groaned, pulling the pillow over my head. Albie, I said. He didn't move. Albie, I shouted. He sat up abruptly, looking around the dimly lit room in confusion. Albie was tall, with broad shoulders. Darby said he would have made a good football player. Football was an earth game where you threw around a ball and knocked into people. I, I didn't really understand it. What's wrong, Bell? Albie asked, his hair sticking out crazily everywhere. It was always funny to see him without his Dodgers ball cap. He only took it off at bedtime. You're snoring, I said. Oh, he said, I thought there was an emergency. This is an emergency. I can't sleep. Ugh, I'm so sorry, Bell, he mumbled and lay back down. I promise not to snore anymore. It was hard to be angry at Albie. He was kind and gentle, a big teddy bear when it came right down to it. A big snoring teddy bear. Ah, dust it, I muttered. Albie could have left, could have, Albie could have the room to himself. I grabbed my blanket and left, Leo padding after me. Not that I blamed him. Even a cat couldn't take Albie's snoring. Leo and I walked down the twisting corridor, our way lit by the cool blue light of nighttime. The light changed to mirror the time of day. In the morning, the blue would transform into a warm, bright yellow. This was supposed to help us have a sense of time because the settlement was mostly underground. It had been built in a giant lava tube, a massive cave-like space left behind by flowing lava millions of years ago. It was the perfect pre-built habitat, keeping us safe from the surface dangers of Mars, radiation, extreme freezing temperatures, and dust. The interior walls were constructed from a space tech gray rubber that curved gently, flowing from one room to the next like a smile. The rooms were round, almost bubble-like for improved structural integrity. 
Sai told me he'd thrown out the old rules when he designed the settlement. Apparently on Earth, people like to live in boxy structures with hard corners. Earth sounded sharp to me. This corridor was a history of my childhood. There was the spot where I banged into the wall with my scooter. There were the scratches on the ceiling from when I tried to make my toy spaceship fly. It didn't work. And of course, the ruler on the wall where memes recorded our growth with a thick black pen. She joked that as some of the first human children to grow up on Mars, we were a living experiment. Farther down the way was a board with digipics of us when we'd arrived on Mars. We were much older now than the babies on the wall. Albie was 17, the oldest in Earth years. And then came Flossie, 16, Vera, 15, Trey, 14, and me, 11. I might have been the youngest, but at least I still knew how to have fun. Unlike the older kids who'd become moody grumps when they turned 13. Now, of course, in Mars years, we were much younger. It takes Mars 687 days to go around the sun, so a Mars year is 687 days, which meant I was only five and Trey was seven. Ahead of me, Leo stopped to sniff at something, his tail flicking in the air. When I was little, there'd been a lot of cats. Bella, Mochi, Harley, Sesame, Little Cat. And as the years went by and the cats died, Leo was the only one left. But I still remembered them all. Then Leo and I were leaving the children's wing and passing the shared areas, the rec room and the mess hall and the kitchen that bookended the two sleeping wings. The rec room was illuminated by the flickering light of a digireel that someone had left playing. Like the rest of the settlement, the room was painted a pale blue. It was supposed to be a soothing color that mimicked the Earth's sky. There was an L-shaped couch with a looped rug woven from old clothing. Darby had created the rocking chair from plastic barrels. Everything got recycled on Mars. Even the plant that decorated the room was made from algae paper, although it was getting old and the leaves had become brittle and started to crumble. Aside from the couch and rocking chair, there was a small plastic table we had played at when we were little. These days, it held Flossie's sewing machine and fabric instead of our clay and crayons. Then there was the plastic display case next to the wall, which housed the rocks we children had collected over the years. After that was the mess hall. It smelled like tonight's supper, an algae casserole that was one of Salty Bill's standard meals. No one was around, so I made a quick stop in the kitchen and grabbed a few ginger cookies. Salty Bill didn't like anyone taking food when he wasn't there, but I figured he wouldn't miss them. Then I was in the grown-up's wing. First was Memes' room. I could find my way to it with my eyes closed when we woke up sick at night. She was the one we went to. Past it was Salty Bill's room. Across from it was Phineas' room. As I passed Eliana and Darby's room, I could hear soft snoring. Eliana had always complained about her husband's snoring, but I never understood what she was talking about. <laughs> I sure did now. Everyone's rooms were dark, except for size. There was a light under his door, and I wondered what kept him from sleep. I left the living quarters behind and followed the corridor that led to the work areas. This part of the settlement was usually buzzing with activity during the day. But in the middle of the night, the only sound was from the air scrubbers hubbing softly in the background like a lullaby. I passed the exercise room, size workshop, the sick bay, various work rooms, the generator room, and my favorite, the algae farm. Just past the algae farm was a circular staircase. I climbed up and up and up the bouncing plastic stairs. I was a little out of breath when I finally reached the communications and observations rooms, also known as CORE or C-O-R. It was above ground and where we sent and received messages from Earth. The, jo the grown-ups jokingly called it the phone booth. The core was the crew's original habitat when they'd first arrived on Mars. Installed by robots, it was a simple dome-like structure. There was a wide window with a sweeping view of the dusty red Martian landscape. No one spent much time here except for Psy. As commander, he sent situation reports to Earth Command. Also, he could monitor the weather better up here. It was the perfect spot to watch whirling dust devils. I like the echoes of the room's previous life. 
taped on the walls were colorful maps of earth places, Pennsylvania, Alabama, Alaska, Michigan. It had been a tradition for the crew to bring a map from their home state. And then there were the plastic lockers for the crew members' belongings. They decorated them with stickers and pictures. The front of Sai's locker had a list of all the places he'd visited. Bucket list, Everest, Antarctica, Moon, Mars. All of them crossed off. Best of all, it was quiet up here. I settled on the couch under the blanket and munched on the cookies. Outside the wide window, Phobos, one of our two moons, was a glowing lump in the darkness. And above it was Earth, a bright, shining star. I wondered if the people on Earth thought about us as much as we thought about them. Even though I'd seen lots of digipics, I still had a hard time imagining Earth. The pool of endless water called the ocean, the places with trees called forests, and of course, the animals. Phineas had told me about the birds that flew through the sky and made their homes, called nests, in trees high above the ground. And as I closed my eyes with Leo curled at my feet, I felt like a bird in a quiet, safe nest. My home. One that I never, ever wanted to leave.